A very good morning and uh, thanks for joining us here on this Facebook live session for BBC Africa. My name is Akwesi Sapong. Wherever you are in Ghana, around Africa or the world, many thanks for joining us. Um, this morning, I have been joined by the chairperson of Ghana's Electoral Commission, Charles And that's because Ghana has a major election coming up on December 7th. There are a lot of outstanding questions about the preparation towards that election. And uh, between Charlotte and myself this morning, hopefully over the next 40 to 50 minutes, we shall attempt to answer a lot of those questions, many of which you have sent to us ahead. Uh, so many thanks for joining us. And let me say, it's a pleasure to have you with us this morning, uh, Mrs. Ose. Thank you, Akwesi. Thank you for having me. So, um, I I'm just going to start off with the, the question that keeps coming up in a lot of the text that we've received here at BBC Africa. It's about whether or not this election will happen on December 7th as constitutional, constitutionally provided. And the background to this basically is uh, you disqualified or the commission disqualified 13 presidential candidates. Four of them have gone through. Uh, I think a minimum of two of them have gone to court. There's been a ruling for the commission to allow one candidate to correct the flaw in the application. A second candidate, the former first lady, is still contesting the issue in court. Uh, and there's a worry that this whole litigation, legal process, could drag on so much so that the election itself may not come on on December 7th. Where do we stand on this? We understand the concerns. From the point of view of the Commission, the elections would definitely happen on December 7th. And um, yes, it's true that um, we did, the Commission did not accept the nominations of 12 of the candidates. For the 13th one, there was um, a legal challenge within his own party to his nomination. So that's a very separate case. For the other ones, there are requirements under the law that you must and meet in your nomination forms. You must have a minimum of 432 validly registered voters endorsing your nomination. You must have, um, you cannot have one um, subscriber nominating more than one presidential candidate. And um, the law permits that if there are omissions on your form, the commission must should point it out to you and you should give them the opportunity to correct it within the nomination period. Now we, we announce the nominations, opening of nominations on the 8th of September. The law also says candidates can submit their nomination form, forms on or before the nomination date. So the period was from the 8th of September to the 30th of September. The final days for receipt of nominations were 29th and the 30th. So there were some candidates who submitted on the 29th, for instance, very a few submitted on the 29th. There was one candidate where we found about 30 omissions. They were pointed out to him, he corrected. Even the former first lady, there were some omissions that we saw apparent on the documents which were pointed out. There were omissions which could only be detected after, such as one subscriber endorsing more than one candidate. It's only when everyone has filed that you can detect that. There were issues of, um, in one case, where one subscriber endorses a candidate in one region and endorses the candidate again in another region with different signatures. There were issues of subscribers appearing on like two, three candidates' forms, the same subscribers, same voter ID numbers with different signatures. So where there were such discrepancies and such um, likelihood of criminal issues, we had to refer those to the police. And if the law says if your forms do not meet the requirements, the Commission has a duty to reject the nomination. And so the Commission acted, so far as we're concerned, in accordance with the law. So far, we've had five challenges. Um, in one of them, I think Dr. Parkway Sindum's case... The candidates of the PPP. The PPP. The court ruled that the Commission, that the error, the Commission should allow him to come in... Correct the Correct the, the, the error. The one anomaly he took to court, which was the case of two different signatures by the same subscriber on the same forms. Then four other candidates have gone to court. Now, it is proper for them to go to court. Um, it's a rule of law. If you're not happy with the decisions 
of the commission, you go to court. You don't go to the streets. So the commission is happy with that. But, yes, but, but the, creates... challenge, the challenge with that, uh, Mrs. Osa, is the fact that um, as we're speaking today, we have 33 days to yes, go I was coming to, that. To, that, if, to the election. If you'll give me a minute, I'll address right. it. So they are right to go to court, but they are all at the high court. And so you have a situation where you can have different high courts giving different rulings. So if one high court says, accept this candidate, and another one says, do not accept the candidate, it's also not a level playing field. So what the commission did was to make an application this week to the Supreme Court. That is the apex court in Ghana, and there's finality to what the Supreme Court says, and the lower courts are bound by the decisions of the Supreme Court. The and Supreme your petition was... Our petition was the order of certiorari right to quash the decision of the High Court in the PPP case. Now, because that case devolved heavily on the meaning of the nomination period, once the court speaks to that, then everyone knows where, what the actual nomination period is and whether the commission can legally permit corrections now. So once the Supreme Court, and we filed a motion for abridgment of time, it was heard yesterday, it was um, approved, and so tomorrow, the Supreme Court is hearing the arguments. We would have finality later by next week. In the meantime... If you don't have finality, if would. the Supreme Court prevails uh, in line with the earlier order, permit them the space to let, let me just, if you just the allow flaw me, or the error yes. in their documentation. That takes, that takes about two, three days. But it brings... But, but here's where there's a difficulty. What's the difficulty? Because the Commission is expected to issue a notice of polls for the presidential election, which must be at least 31 days before the general election. The this Court, is eating into the that Supreme expectation Court, of a notice of polls. The Supreme Court is very aware of the timelines. In fact, we've, we've told the Supreme Court what the timelines are. We've also even told the court how much time we need with the printers to print the presidential ballots. So we've done all that, it's in our pleadings and they are aware of it. Now, if you don't do what we've done, you risk a multiplicity of high court suits. Now, you could also have a situation where you go as a commission and you say, we're going to permit these corrections outside the filing period. And your decision is also challenged by candidates who have properly qualified and who acted within the nomination period. So you cannot only look at the, 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 the case from the perspective of those whose nominations were not accepted. You also have to look at the rights of those who met the requirements within the nomination period and the fact that they can challenge you if you open the door, in their view, illegally to other candidates to come and contest them. So we have to be very balanced and we have to follow the law. The law is not always the way we want it. It's you, not how we want it, but we have to follow the law. There is uh, an inter-party advisory committee which has representatives from the political parties, as yes. well as the Electoral Commission. Why were these issues dealt with at that level long before, way before the deadline came out? By which time, obviously, as you say, uh, there wasn't room for you to give people the, the chance to, to fix the flaws, because if that had happened, then, as you say, you could face, um, you know, But uh, suits. IPAC, IPAC is not a law court. B legal, but it's a conventional uh, platform issues. for you to resolve issues we, before they get to the legal but stage. But this is a legal issue. At the IPAC stage, you discuss what the processes are. You don't discuss the law. The law is passed by parliament. The law has always existed. We're acting within CI 94, which was passed by parliament. At IPAC, you discuss the processes. You discuss the rollouts. You don't resolve legal challenges at IPAC because you're not a court of law. And for everyone whose rights are affected, somebody is, you know, is also to the detriment of somebody else. The suggestion here is if, if these issues have been dealt with at the which ones? Uh, at, at that level, like which one? Um, you know, uh, flaws or errors in the application forms, the whole process. How is IPAC then, going to then, deal with then that? You did, then you didn't need to have to go to court. No, in but the how first is IPAC? We didn't go to court. Remember, the law says that the commission shall take a decision. The chairperson of the commission is returning officer for presidential elections. So my job is to receive the forms, examine the forms, and if, there are any, if there's any legal basis where the forms cannot be accepted, report to the commission, and the entire commission takes a decision. It's not a decision to be taken by IPAC. If you take that decision to IPAC, anybody can challenge you. The commission has to act in accordance with the law. 
And there's a lot of electoral laws we have to follow. As soon as you start exercising discretion wrongly, that in itself is wrong. If the law says that someone must provide ABC to be properly qualified, it's not a decision to be taken by IPAC. That would be the commission abdicating its legal responsibilities to the people of Ghana to IPAC. And I think that is wrong. Again, to my original question. Yes. What is the guarantee that the election will happen on December 7th? Bearing in mind all the suits, the legal issues, the hurdles that you have to jump up. Through her leadership, the Chief Justice, she's made earlier pronouncements that they would not allow lawsuits to subvert the process. And so we're going to get a definitive ruling from the Supreme Court, likely this week, at the latest early next week. In the meantime, we have started the process of printing the parliamentary ballots to mix up you know, some of the time. And so we're in a good place to meet the, um, the, the, the December dates. Um, and many thanks to uh, many of you who've been sending us questions, which we crowdsource from you. Uh, so let me raise some of those questions so we sure. can answer uh, answer them. There is a, a, a question here from Gad Anthony Adeji uh, in Koforidia in Ghana, who says, uh, Mrs. Osei has said previously that if results are, are not signed, it won't affect the results declaration. There's a question about whether you actually made that statement or if that is the guiding principle. Uh, but what measures are therefore being put in place so anomalies will be worked out amicably to bring about credible elections? Okay. Um, I haven't said that. But in 2012, you know, after the 2012 presidential elections, we were in court in 2013. And one of the issues that came up for determination by the court was whether the absence of the signatures of presiding officers would invalidate the, re the results. And the Supreme Court dismissed that by majority decision. So that is the law. However, it does not mean that we are encouraging um, presiding officers not to sign results. Indeed, we have added it to the offenses in um, this year's um, constitutional instrument regulating the elections. And in the training we're having for the election officials, we're emphasizing not just the obligations, but the sanctions in the law. But when we get the results at the polling station level, um, we're going to have about 29,000 polling stations, less eight or so. Mm. Presiding officers have a duty to sign off the results. And party agents and candidate agents also have to sign the results if they have any basis for challenging the results. They can ask for a recount at the polling station, one recount. After that recount, if they still do not want to accept the results, then they have to, there's a form they can fill to show why they do not want to sign the results. But if you have, let's say, 10 agents and one agent does not sign, it does not invalidate the results, would of course have to check into the basis for the challenge and make sure that it is... Um, it is and establish whether it is substantiated or not, and then we can go ahead with the final declarations. What we're doing this year in terms of the integrity of the collation process is that yes, we'll go through the presiding officer signs, they take it to the um, constituency collation center, there's 275 of them, where the results are collated. The candidates and the parties have counting agents there as well who can sign off the results after collation. And after the collation, it is also going to be electronically transmitted to the Electoral Commission. We're still working on finalizing that process. We would do a demonstration at IPAC, make sure everybody's satisfied with the transmission process. But So we're going to have two sets of results. The manual, which is the legal one, still prevails if there's any discrepancy. So that's as the main As document. the main one, the one right. that has been signed off by the parties and the Electoral Commission. And that's complemented by? By the, the, the um, electronic one. It just makes it easier for us to see all the results from the collation centres and the polling stations at the head office before we declare the final results. If I may just take us a few steps back, back. just so, as we on the issue of the question of integrity yes. of the poll process. So let's start from the beginning, if we mm -hmm. may. Um, in May this year, uh, the, the Supreme Court basically gave you a list or a set of actions that the Commission had, had to take to secure the integrity of the whole ballot process. Um, no. In May 2016... Not um, the integrity of the ballot process. There were issues regarding the register. 
people who had registered in 2012 with NHIS cards. And the Supreme Court ordered that the Electoral Commission should delete those names and give them the opportunity to re-register. That's very different from the ballot process. But we can talk about the right, ballot but process. That is at the heart of integrity yes. of, of the electoral yes. process. Perhaps yes. the wrong choice of was the electoral process. Yes. So uh, the point I was going to make was about the re-registration yes. exercise. Yes. How foolproof has it been? Oh, that was not that complicated. We presented a list of 56,000 plus to the Supreme Court. And the court's orders were to delete those names and any other ones we may find of people who had registered with NHIS cards. And so we did that. And then they were given um, 10 days to re-register. And there were complaints in those 10 days about 26,000 of them re-registered. There were complaints that there were more who could not meet the timeline, so we extended it. Um, in total, about 29,000 of them re-registered. So we finished with that. And then we also introduced this year the continuous voter registration. So there was a mop-up exercise for people who had missed the major registration exercise earlier in the year. So we've gone through all that. We've gone through the exhibition. Political parties had the provisional register. We went through exhibition. Um, objections were made to some people on the register. The judicial process has dealt with those objections. We find that we've implemented all the um, decisions from the objection process. And we have the final register now, which we've given to the political parties already. Are there any outstanding steps that you need to, you still need to take? On the or, register? On that, that's right. No. All we have to do now in terms of the register is to give to the political parties the list of the people who would be taking part in the special voting on December 1st, the early voting. Then we have to give them the list, proxy list, transfer list, all the lists that go with the register. And special voting has to do with uh, people special in essential voting, services, doctors? No. Special, um, no. special voting under the law has to do with people who are working on election day. Right. So election officials, media, and security personnel. Right. Okay. Yes. So that stage is what you need to do with, with, the, with the parties. We need to give them the list. Right. Um, and then we bring it to on election day yes. itself. What measures have you taken? In terms of what? In terms of the biometric vote process itself. What are the expectations on the day? Okay. Um, maybe we should step back to the entire election day. Yeah. On election day, there are about 97 different items which you need to send to every polling station. Um, about 95 of those items are in and they are ready. Okay. They've been dispatched to the regions. Ballot boxes, voting screens, ID jackets, all that. Ready indelible ink, verification stamp. We've done all, all that. All deployed. Yes. So now we've started printing of the ballots. Um, we're just about to start the parliamentary ballots. The political parties and the security agencies will be informed because they are present at the printing houses when we're printing the ballots. And they will also be notified when the ballots are being moved to the regions. So when we get there on election day, what happens is the first thing that the presiding officer has to do at the polling station, polling starts at 7. Mm -hmm. Before 7, he has to open the ballot boxes in the presence of all the party agents for them to ascertain that it is empty. And then he has to put his seal, the unbreakable seal, on the ballot box. And the parties and candidates also put their seals, if they want to, on the ballot boxes. And then voting starts. Agents are present. This year, what we are doing differently, learning from 2012. In 2012, we had one biometric verification machine at each polling station. This year, we're going to have two. Why? Is it because you had problems because in 2012? Because we had challenges with some of the machines. Which caused a delay or to the caused, end of voting. And in some places, voting had to be cancelled and done the following day. So now we're going to have two machines per polling station. So as backup. As backup. So there's a primary and there's a backup. So if any... But there was also, I think, a question about batteries for, no, for we the have, machines. No, we have batteries for all the machines because the batteries need to be changed every four hours. Mm. And then we're going to have about a 20% backup of the machines at the district level. So when, What does that mean, 20% backup? Depending on the number of polling stations in the district, you're going to have a certain number of extra machines kept at the district so that if you are on your primary machine and it develops a problem and you switch to the number two machine, we would deploy 
a number three there. Okay. We also have four technicians in every district to support the process. So that if there's any technical challenge, the technicians come in. And then at the national level, we're going to have a, um, a, an upstream with 20 technicians connected by phone to all the presiding officers. So if there's any technical challenge, they also come in. And there's going to be an open line for the public as well. So if anyone notices anything, any challenges, any issues, any problems, it may involve security, intimidation, we can call in the, the security personnel to come in. So on election day, we are not anticipating any problems with the machines. But if there is, we've made adequate arrangements to make sure that we don't have the situation we had in 2012. And so voting, we expect, will go on smoothly until 5 p.m. After 5 p.m., the devices tell you how many people have been verified and have voted. Also, We should tally with the number of people on the registers, on, on, the, on the voters' roll. For it should not tally. If anything, it should be less. It should be less. Yes. It, sorry, it should be within. Within, yes. yes. Because what, you're going to, what happens is that the register you have at every polling station has a barcode. When you show up to vote and they found your name on the register, they scan on the barcode and your details pop up. So when your face pops up, this is Akwisi Sapong, age, sex, and all that, then that barcode is deactivated. It cannot be activated again. Then you now go through the biometric verification process. You put your name on the BVD. It says, yes, the fingerprints match with the person, and then you are given your ballots and you're allowed to go and vote. So at the end of the voting day, the number of deactivated barcodes on the register and the number of people who have been verified by the machine, I'll deal with the manual verification in a moment, should tally with the number of ballots in the box. Right, right. So when all we go through all that, voting ends at 5 p.m. At 5 p.m., then the votes, the boxes are open, the parties and candidates remove their seals. Now that's depending that the last person in the queue has Yes, but voted. usually it's 5 p.m. Right. If you're in the queue at 5 p.m., the security personnel will stand at the end of, of the, the queue. queue at 5 p.m. so that anyone who comes after 5 p.m. cannot vote. Then the box is opened and the, the parties remove their seals, presiding officer removes his seals, and then counting in public begins. Counting is done. It is recorded on the results sheets for the polling station. Then the presiding officer signs, and the parties and their candidates also sign. And then those results are now moved to the constituency collision center. So everyone at the station who is a party or candidate agent gets a copy of the results. So that's prior to uh, the relay or the transmission to the collating center? Yes. Okay. Uh, let's quickly back backtrack again and talk about the manual verification. Process. That's yes. right. Um, in 2012, one of the challenges we had were people who would go to the um, polling station and the device would reject them, even though they were on the register validly. And the catchphrase at the time was no verification, no, no vote. vote. So people were not allowed to vote because yes. they couldn't be verified. They couldn't be verified. And some people have naturally low quality fingerprints. Others, especially in the um, farming communities, you'd find out that just the pressure of work, their fingerprints are worn, and so they usually have a challenge. Some of those ones are on the register as FO, face only, meaning they identified facially. But we still do have a problem. When we did the exhibition... Sorry, so by face means we look at a photo of them in the register and see whether it matches yes, because with... when you get there, remember when they scan your barcode, your biographic details and your pictures pop will, up. will pop up. So you can be identified mm. by that because you're FO in the register. It's a small number. But now, um, when we did the exhibition, one of the things we did this year was to introduce the biometric verification devices at the exhibition centres. How does it work? It's the same thing. Before, when you go to check your details on the register to confirm or you want to make a change, we make, sure, we make you put your fingerprints to make sure that you are who you say you are. Mm. But it also gave us the opportunity to check the likelihood of false rejects. We got a 0.5% rate. 
So even if the machines are working at 99% accuracy, there's still a risk of people being falsely rejected. And what do they do in that circumstance? And because we didn't want them disenfranchised, so we introduced manual verification. The way that works is when you get into the station and you give them your card or you don't have your card, you tell them your name, they find you on the register, they scan the barcode, your details come up. We know you're on the register. You put your fingers on the device, it does not um, validate you. So what happens is, to the extent that they've established that you're a validly registered voter, then there's a manual verification form, which the presiding officer would fill out, which would state the voter's name, the voter's ID number, the polling station, the time the incident of the false rejection is occurring. And then there are three questions which the presiding officer is required to answer. Whether the person is on the register, whether the picture tallies with the person standing there and all that. And then the presiding officer now signs, the voter also signs, and then the party agents who are there all sign, and then the person is, put, is allowed to vote. So at the end of the day, when we count the number of people that the machine has verified, we would add the number who have been manually verified as well because their forms are there, signed by the presiding officer and the agent. And all that should tally with the number of votes in the box. So we've come to the closure of the, the vote. Yes. Results have been counted. They've been relayed now to the collation center. No, they've been announced first, uh, they've been at, announced announced first. at the polling station. Right. And everyone has their copy. Everyone has their copy. But now they have to send to... The constituency the, collation center. center. And then from there to EC headquarters. No, let's stop at the constituency collation okay. center first. So if you have, let's say, 100 polling stations in that constituency, all the 100 polling station results, as well as the ballot papers, are put in tamper-proof envelopes and they are moved to the um, constituency collation. Who moves them? The presiding officer. Are there any other witnesses? Party reps? Oh, they security. are all going to the same place, okay. yes, and the security. So they all. So move. they escort the presiding officer? Yes. Right. Because remember, at this point, all the parties and the candidates' agents are already holding copies mm. of the polling station results. Right. And would have already relayed it to the parties anyway. So they all moved to the constituency collation center, where all the results from the 100 polling stations or so are now put together. Because the returning officer at the constituency announces the results for the parliamentary. That's right. So all the results are put together there, added up, and... Um, put on a form, everyone, again, it's signed by the um, returning officer at the Constituency Collation Centre, and the counting, the candidates are entitled to their counting agents. So the candidates and the party's agents are there. Again, the sign of the results. Everybody gets a copy, and then it is announced there. That is for the parliamentary. That is for the parliamentary. And that is the job of the returning officer, officer. to declare yes. once they've all been signed up. Signed up. Right. For the, for the for presidential, the presidential, there's a separate form where they put it on, and that is now sent to the National Coalition Centre. How is it sent? Um, usually it's sent by fax, but that's where we're changing things up this year. You've updated things. We've updated so talk us through that. So now what is going to happen at the Constituency Coalition Centre is two things we're doing differently this time. After the results have been signed off by the parties and they've all got their copies, it is now entered again. So we have a copy of the signed off one, which can still be faxed to Accra. That's the manual process still going that on. That has been standard. Yeah. That is still going on. Then we're now updating that process. It is now entered into a laptop, which is connected to a projector. And it is put on the projector screen so everyone can see that the results they are holding is the same as what has been typed into the system and put on the screen. So the, the, the results being faxed yes. to Accra yes. will also be projected onto a screen yes. for everyone to see. To see. Okay. And then when that is done, it is going to be transmitted to Accra. We're also asking that all the... Um, polling station results are also scanned and transmitted to Accra. So that when we are in Accra, the National Collation Centre, we're getting two things. We're not just getting the collation, the collated results from the 275 constituencies. We're also getting scanned copies 
of all the results brought by the presiding officers from the 29,000 polling stations. Well, when, when you use the word transmission, uh, you pique my interest. So one, uh, the results for the presidential election uh, are being faxed to Accra, to HQ, what we, the so-called strong room. No longer strong. No longer. What is it now? It's a uh, national coalition centre. National coalition centre. It's open to everyone. At the election, electoral commission headquarters. headquarters yeah. And it's open to everyone. It's going to be open. We'll have cameras in there. We'll have party agents in there. So everyone can take part in the collation of the national results. Right. So it's being faxed. And then you say also will be transmitted. How? Electronically. Explain. Well, we're working with the telcos. We'll come out with that soon. And that's one of the things we want to demonstrate to IPAC first and get the input of IPAC. So it's still work in progress? We're almost done. We're what almost stage done. are you? Oh, we finished. We, we've signed contracts with the telco companies. What is the thinking, the idea behind this technology? The idea is that as the returning officer for the presidential elections... That's you. That's me. I should not just see collated results. But you have the facts. I should see the 29,000 polling station results before right. I declare. And this came out of the Electoral Reform Committee, which we set up after the 2012 elections. It was one of the recommendations that was made by that committee that the presiding officer, the returning officer, should see the results. And it's good because now we're going to have two sets of results. So at least if there's any discrepancy, you can know that there's an anomaly somewhere and you can correct it. it so it gives us the benefit of parallel results. Are you able to talk about, you know, the, 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 the technology, the, the no, thinking behind the now. technology? Because you mentioned that you're not working now. with the telcos. Not now, but it's going to, we're ensuring that it is secure. And because that is where the well, some of the the political parties are raising well, the, 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 the red flags about the integrity they would, of that they would transmission see, process. They would see all that at IPAC. But when? let's not forget oh, before the elections. How let's, many how many weeks? How no, many I days before I the election? Say, I, I'm not with my technical team. It's to uh, be what timelines have been have you been given by the telcos and the technical people in terms I'm of I'm sure in the next election. two weeks. But definitely, there's going to be demonstrations at IPAC. But let's not forget that the electronic results are parallel. The main results process is still the manual one, which we've always done within 48 to 72 hours of elections. Um, and we've always told them that if there's a discrepancy between what we see in the manual results and what we see in the electronic one, the manual one is going to prevail. Are you able to get a sense of how the poll has gone across the 29 polling stations? 20 just just 28,000 29, polling stations, just with the manual results that would have been faxed to you. Are you able to get that sense? Yes, you'll get it from the collated ones, but That's we right. need the backup, the the, 20, the primary ones from the... And the reason I ask is, uh, so say assuming the integrity of the, the, the result transmitted to you was tampered with, would you consider doing without it? Yes. The manual one is the legal one. That's the legal That's document the legal that you're one. working yes. with? Yes. So if there are any questions about what's been transmitted we were, to Accra, you, has, put, you set that aside. Of course. It's a manual one. And of, we also have CODEO, the Coalition of Domestic Election Observers in Ghana, which is, as you know, it's a, it's a wide organization of very reputable, more than 30 state institutions and Working parallel society. to you and also telling the they, results. They are also doing a private voter, tab, private results tabulation. And we are also going to get feedback from them on what their tabulation is. You know, I, I wish you could tell us just a bit more about this, the technology I think the first and place, this transmission The first place process, we should be really. discussing that should be IPAC with the primary stakeholders. In the but, but you also have a bigger yes, uh, set of stakeholders we, we, who are we, watching after, you now and watching you know, all that works. After we finish with IPAC and all the integrity mechanisms are in place, then that's a good time to speak to it. Right. Um, how long do voters have to wait to know the presidential election results? We're hoping within 48 hours, maximum 72 hours, we should have the results. Within? Within, yeah. Not beyond? Not beyond. It would go be... The only reason I can see us going beyond is because our elections in Ghana tend to be very close. If it's so close, it may be more prudent to stop, inform everyone, do a total recount and be sure of what we're announcing, finally. If the difference between the leading candidate and the second next is so close... Yeah. It just may be more prudent to make an announcement that it's better we start the counting process just to be sure. Just to be sure. But I do not think, well, at this point it's too early to tell. 
in in the time the the results are coming in, there is a question about you know communication, information dissemination, keeping people updated. What is the strategy? What is the plan to keep people, you know, in the loop? The plan is that we're going to have a very robust communications process going on. There will be at least early updates to the media of what is going on, which results have come in. Um, if there are any challenges, we would tell the public ahead of time that these are the challenges, but we will be having early um, briefings with the media. We have four minutes to wrap up. So quick questions, uh, brief responses. Uh, will the Electoral Commission not be influenced by the power of incumbency? That's from Peri Agbo in Calabar, Nigeria. It is impossible for the Electoral Commission to be influenced. Why? Because our processes are so transparent and so inclusive that it is Im impossible for the Electoral Commission itself. There are seven of us at the Commission. There's um, um, head office directors, there's regional directors. We are going to be working with 140, almost 146,000 staff on Election Day. And at the 29,000 polling stations and the coalition centers, can all candidates and parties have agents there. For you to influence the process, you have to change your result sheets, change all the result sheets being held by all the candidates' agents who would have probably taken it home as soon as it, the process is over, before you can change the ones at head office. So it's really impossible. The way the Ghanaian system works, um, the process is so strong that it is difficult for persons to interfere with it. Um... Noete Asamoah is watching us in Texas, United States. How transparent will early voting and overseas voting be? Um, overseas voting, they are voting by proxy. They have appointed proxy. We send the forms to them. And the proxy list have been given to the political parties. Um, early voting, political parties will get the list. Political parties would be present and would have their seals on the ballot boxes as well. So there's nothing we can do. We cannot announce results until political parties take off their seals. Then we can count. Um, <laughs> results, yeah, I'm juggling between this and that. No. Results declaration, you are the returning officer for the presidential election. Yes. Uh, how are you using social media and your online portal? Uh, are you putting some results on, for example, your, your, do you still have your Facebook wall up? Because yes, we do. in 2012, the last election, um, results were on the Facebook wall, even before they were announced by the commissioner at the time. Um, so how is this going to work? What is the plan? And also, uh, your website, the last two weeks... There have been a few technical challenges on and off, even suggestions unsubstantiated of it being hacked. Today we checked, there were a few problems. No, Are you going, will you be posting results there as well? We'll be posting results there. On election day and after, there's going to be a lot of traffic. Yes, and we're working on that. We need to increase the bandwidth. We need to look at the capacity again. We've had um, unprecedented um, interest and hits on our website, so we're, we're expanding the capacity to take care of um, the kind of... Um, interest we're getting and also the kind of data we'll be uploading. Uh, I think you mentioned this. I want to know if the results from polling stations will be cancelled if there's an event of overvoting. This yes. is Squissy Crew in Accra, yes. Ghana. So it's yes. a definitely yes on that. Okay, quickly. Um, this is more about you. Okay. There's been some fruity language as in there. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Attacks on you personally since taking up this job. Uh, some of them also targeted the, the Chief Justice of Ghana herself, a woman. Um, and some of this language uh, has come also from a very well-known MP. Do you regret taking this job? No, I do not regret it. It's, um, it's not an easy job, but it was not meant to be an easy job. Um, and when you're a woman in, um, in a space that some people believe should be male... You should expect this. Um, it's it's also a job that requires that you take difficult decisions. And people do not always understand the decisions that are taken. They also do not understand that you are chairing a commission. So when you speak, you're speaking on behalf of seven people, really. It's not your own personal. Um, it's not your voice. You're not speaking for yourself. So it's very easy for them to misunderstand and to personalize the attacks. It comes with a territory. It's, um, it's to be expected, being female. It's to be expected in the kind of job it is. Um, 
chairs of electoral commission globally have the same challenges. Every decision you take makes one person happy, doesn't make another person happy. It comes with the territory. You, you just have to learn to handle it with grace. Um, I have a lot of support. Um, my faith, my family, my friends. And then I get a lot of support from random Ghanaians. You meet them on flights. They reach out to you via social media. Some try and get your phone number, your email address, and they send you messages of support. Does so, your husband feel you've taken on too much? No. He feels it's a tough job and that it's his absolute duty to just give me as much support as I need. He recognizes that it is service to country and service to God. It's not meant to be easy, but someone has to do it. But what does all of this say, do you think, about, you know, well, the place of women in leadership and, you know, also as key players in Ghana's political space? Because there's always been an argument of not enough women of ability being or getting involved. Yes, and I can see why not, not enough women want to get involved. But it's also that society is not making enough space for women. We have to consciously as a society realize that women have a very key role to play. If you exclude women, you're excluding 51% of your population. And for me, that's like a car running, moving around on two tires instead of four. It's in society's interest to have women there. And for me personally, it is um, onerous in the sense that I recognize that I stand on the shoulders of women who have been first. Her ladyship, the Chief Justice, we've had first female Attorney General speakers. They've opened the doors. And I also have a duty to do a good job for the young women who are coming after me so that other women can also stand on my shoulders and contribute to serving the nation. You're talking here about legacy. Yes. Um, and just before we wrap up, a, a question that's just come in and it's actually attributed to a Ghanaian newspaper, The Statesman. Uh, saying or running a story suggesting that the Electoral Commission has awarded an $80 million contract to a dissolved printing firm in the United Kingdom. I don't have the very fine details, I but do. I suppose you are across it. I do. What can you tell us about this? That is not true. We have awarded a contract for the printing of some of the election forms to a company that has always printed it previously for us and has now relocated to Ghana, which made their pricing better for us. Do you care to name them? I think it's Aerovote, which made their pricing better for us, and which meant that this time we did not have to bear the high freight charges that we would have um, had to bear, and also the time for shipping the, the, the security, is, is high-level security printing, you know, shipping it into Ghana. And the, the worry, I suppose, here will be the fact that in the United Kingdom, this firm is dissolved, but non-existent. This, we did not dissolved. award it to a UK company that had dissolved. We awarded it to a company that has come to set up in Ghana and is properly registered in Ghana, went through a rigorous procurement process, satisfied all the requirements of Ghanaian law to be awarded the con contract. If a company decides to relocate wrap up his business in one country and move to another country. Does that mean that they should be excluded from bidding for contracts in the new country they've relocated to? Especially when they have a track record of printing for Ghana previously. Were well, questions asked about why they chosen to relocate the operation from the United Kingdom that would to not Ghana? Be, they did is not it a question the Commission will be interested in? No. Why not? Uh, because that is not part of the requirement process, the procurement process. There's very stringent laws for procurement in Ghana, particularly to a public institution. Our job is to make sure that you meet the requirements under our law. Companies move from one country to others for all kinds of reasons, all kinds of reasons. That would be unfairly penalizing companies that have decided to relocate. I'm happy that they relocated to Ghana. At least they're hiring Ghanaians, they're creating jobs in Ghana. Um do we know the constitution of this firm? When they operated in the United Kingdom, how much information do you have about who they were when they were based they in were the UK? We were not even printing directly with them. They were work, we were working through agents. And now we actually can work with them directly, which is actually a more efficient process for us and it's cheaper. Mrs. Osei, I think we would have to wrap it here, having exhausted as much as we can in the time that we have. Uh, many thanks for joining us for this Facebook Live. And your final word is 
you are basically set for this election on December 7. Ghana is set. The elections are going to be very transparent, very inclusive, very credible. And there's lots of integrity mechanisms in our system to ensure that what people of Ghana put in the ballot box is what the Electoral Commission is going to declare as the results. But there's still questions about the electronic transmission process and you are committing to tell us more about it after you have exactly. briefed uh, the party representatives exactly. at IPAC level. That is just another level of results. That's the right. primary mo mode of results transmission in Ghana remains the manual one. But the parties are concerned uh, still about the electronic They're transmission process of it. IPAC. So the timelines you want to give on briefing them will be within the next two weeks. Oh, yes. Because they'll, they'll we have less the than IPAC. 33 days now to mm -hmm. go to the they'll election. Get that before the election. If there was a second round? It will be on the 28th of December. That is set in stone. Yes. Mrs. Osei, thank you very much. My pleasure, Chrissy. Thank you for having me. And thank you very much for joining us for the last uh, 45 minutes or so. Uh, talk about this. Tell everyone who needs to know about the Ghanaian election. And you can watch this back because it will be up on our page uh, most of today and the days to come. Thanks for watching.